The League of Women Voters and the Charlottesville Newsplex proudly present the only televised Charlottesville debate between candidates for the 5th Congressional District, incumbent Tom Periello and challenger Robert Hurt, face-to-face, -face, live from the campus of Piedmont, Virginia Community College. Now, here's your debate moderator, CBS 19 anchor Dan Schutte. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special evening. Let's start out by welcoming our two candidates. Uh, the, the incumbent candidate, the incumbent candidate is Tom Periello, a Democrat from Ivy, seeking his second term in Congress. He is representing the 5th District. And his challenger, his challenger is Robert Hurt, a Republican, a state senator from Chatham. Now, the candidates... The candidates have agreed to the format developed by the League of Women Voters. We're very thankful to League members in Charlottesville, Albemarle County, and Fluvanna County for sponsoring and organizing this event. We're also grateful to Piedmont Virginia Community College for allowing us to use this fantastic facility here. And for those of you here tonight, thank you very much for attending. To those in our audience on CBS 19 and ABC 16, Newsplex.com, and on the radio with Monticello Media, thank you for dedicating this next hour to being an informed voter on Election Day. Now, the candidates have agreed to three rounds of questioning. Our panel will go first, then we'll ask questions submitted by our audience here and our TV and radio audiences. Then, as time allows, our panel will have another chance to ask the candidates a question. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer those questions, although they are by no means required to take all that time. The shorter the answer, the more questions we get to ask. And I would ask you to please hold all your applause until the end of the debate. If we're ready, let's begin. By coin flip, the first question goes to Mr. Hurt. It comes to us from the League of Women Voters President, Lauren Intalabe Camille. Lauren? The Disclose Act is currently being considered by Congress to address the regulation of certain political spending what is your position on the Disclose Act? I will answer that question, but first let me just uh, first say a word of thanks to PVCC. I want to thank each of you who is here in the audience tonight, and I also want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this tonight. I think that it will be a lively debate, and I appreciate the opportunity to set out the two visions in this race. The vision of Tom Periello that in includes government-run health care, uh, cap and trade, as well as a failed stimulus package versus our vision, which is an opportunity, uh, an opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, is is also uh, driven by a, a desire for opportunity, and of course our uh, and what we all want, and that is a renewed American dream. To answer your question, I am in, against the, the Disclose Act, and I'm against the Disclose Act because I believe that uh, it is not right for the government to be keeping lists of people who are members of certain groups. Uh, if you look at the, at the guts of the Disclose Act, uh, you will see that there are certain groups uh, that were exempt, like the NRA, for instance, because they didn't want government uh, to be keeping lists of persons who are members of their group. By the same token, uh, the Farm Bureau, on the other hand, uh, was not exempt. So it seems to me that, uh, that we need to be concerned about uh, negative advertising. I think transparency is important, uh, but by the same token, I think that we have got to protect our First Amendment rights, and I would have voted against the Disclose Act. And now, Mr. Periello, the question goes to you. Well, first, let me echo the thanks to everyone for being here and certainly to Piedmont Virginia Community College and all the community colleges in Central and Southern Virginia uh, that have been an essential part of giving people a great opportunity to move into the workforce. And uh, certainly, I've been a big supporter of community colleges and to the League of Women Voters. Uh, I not only uh, would support the Disclose Act, I have co-sponsored and voted for the Disclose Act. Uh, it is actually a principle that true conservatives fought for for 15 years which is that one of the answers to the horrific problem of how we finance our campaigns is simply that voters should have the chance to know who's behind these ads. I find it shocking that Senator Hurt would not be for this basic principle of voters having the information. 
Now, I know that he has gotten a great deal of support from groups that are actively fundraising from China, from Bahrain, from Egypt, from Russia. Ladies and gentlemen. And this is shocking. I would think he would want to be at the forefront of this effort to be able to say that and be able to say, let's open up those books. Conservatives who have gone after different liberals who've contributed to campaigns and seen that as fair game until it's on their side. I think when voters have more information, it's better for democracy and better for the electorate. We have an unprecedented influx of corporate cash into the elections this year. Much of it, to the tune of millions of dollars, has gone to Senator Hurt to fund misinformation about what's going on in the economy. Where I come from, where I grew up around here, if you want to take a position, you put your name on it. You're willing to stand by it. That's a basic standard of decency and of integrity. Why is it that these groups want to be so secretive? Why, if they believe these positions or are okay with taking this money from corporations here or overseas, would they not do it? Senator Hurt and others have been funded by the, some of the biggest outsourcers of American jobs in American history. This is one of the most important things in this campaign. Are we going to give up on the idea that we can build and make and grow things in America again? I feel like they have given up on this. I still believe All we right. can do it. Congressman, your time is up. Our next question goes to Mr. Pagliello first. It comes from PVCC President Dr. Frank Friedman. Gentlemen, it will come as no surprise that my questions tonight will be about education. What do you believe is the role of the federal government in education? And in your answer, would you please give at least one example of a piece of legislation or a policy on education that you would support? Well, I think there are a few elements more crucial to the American dream than the idea that every child, no matter what town they're born in, no matter what zip code, has the chance to reach their full potential. My dad grew up very poor, and he had a chance through financial aid and other means to make it to the University of Virginia and to move into the middle class and up. It was an amazing thing to go from the children of Italian immigrants to being able to see he and his siblings go to college. That opportunity is crucial not just for the human dignity of each individual, but for building and sustaining the American middle class in the way that the GI Bill did for our veterans after World War II. In the last year, we have fought hard to have the largest expansion of student grants uh, in financial aid in a generation. Because what we've seen is a signal sent to our children too often that says if you work hard and play by the rules, you can go to college and incur tens of thousands of dollars of debt that you will spend years and years trying to fight your way out of. I think trying to make college a little more affordable is important. But we also have to treat with the same dignity someone who wants to learn a trade, get career and technical training, whether that's through a trade school or through the community college system. In order for us to outcompete China and the world in this global economy, we are going to have to make sure that we create opportunities for every child to do that. It's meant the world to my family. It's meant the world to me and so many people that I see around central and southern Virginia where it's been a life-changing experience to get that access, to make it a little more affordable, to get that university or community college education. So I think it's very important. It's been particularly important in some of our rural counties where uh, it has been important for people to be able to step in and ensure even in our rural areas there's access to broadband technology that we've helped expand in central and southern Virginia and that people have that opportunity whether urban, suburban, uh, or rural. All right. Thank you, Mr. Perriello. Mr. Hurt, your response. Thank you, Frank. I, too, agree that education is a fundamental component to freedom and liberty in this country. And I think that it is fitting that we are here talking about education in Charlottesville, uh, where Thomas Jefferson lived uh, and where he created such a template for, uh, for education for our young people and for, 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 for all people across the world. Uh, I think that it is critical that we support education. And I've been proud, as a member of the Virginia General Assembly, to support education year in and year out. There is no question that it is critical as a father. I recognize its, its importance. And certainly as a citizen, I recognize its importance as we try to compete in a global marketplace and have increasing challenges in making sure that our children and our workforce are better educated. So I am committed to that principle and have been committed to that principle as a me member of the legislature. I think, however, when you start talking about the federal government and its role uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in education, I think you have to take into account that the states have been given that, m that responsibility as well as the localities. 
I believe in the, in the concept uh, that it is the parents and it is the people that are closest to the classroom who actually make the difference. What role does the federal government play now? So often that role is one of taking tax dollars from the local citizen and having it go to Washington, D.C., where a Washington, D.C. bureaucrat takes his cut and then sends the balance, uh, what's left, back down uh, to the localities where the real work is being done. I think that the uh, federal government should have a limited role in, in education. I think instead <coughs> we need to promote and, 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 and encourage uh, strong policies like we have in Virginia uh, at a state and local level. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Our next question goes to, it goes to Mr. Hurt first. It comes from News Talk Radio WCHV News Director Melissa Neely. Melissa. My question is on immigration. What is your view on how illegal immigration impacts Virginians and Americans in general, and what is your solution for problems with current immigration policies? Well, first of all, I am one who believes, uh, like probably most here, that the fact that we are a land of immigrants is our greatest strength. Uh, it is our greatest strength historically, and I think it will continue to be a great strength for us uh, as, as, as Americans. But let's be clear about something. America, the illegal immigration in this country is a problem. It is a severe problem. Uh, what we have uh, allowed to happen and what has happened, what Congressman Perriello and, and the crowd in Washington have allowed to happen over the years has been to an open border policy where you have illegal immigrants coming in and out of this country at will. Uh, the biggest problem, the biggest problem that's caused by this, of course, is a problem of national security. We should know who is coming in and out of our borders. Uh, and we only need to think about September 11th to be reminded of what happens when we don't have secure borders. So we must secure the border. I also believe that, that, that the effects of illegal immigration are real, not only in terms of state budgets that have to pay for health care and education, but also for public safety. You stop and think about the problems that the folks in Arizona, who, by the way, had to step up and, and, and take care of the problem themselves because of the failure of the United States Congress, you stop and think about the public safety implications uh, that have affected them. I think that Congress has failed on, immigration, on illegal immigration. I think that the key to, to, to solving a problem is to secure the border and then enforce the laws that we have, enforce the laws that are on the books. And if we do that, we'll go a long way uh, towards solving this problem. All right, thank you. And Mr. Perriello, your response. Uh, for me, this is a basic question of fairness. It's not fair for someone who breaks the law to get ahead of line for someone who goes through the incredible arduous process of trying to do this legally. It's not fair for someone who's running a landscaping business, who's paying pe people legally and on the books to try to outbid or outcompete with another small business owner who's not following the rules. We have to have rules in place that enforce uh, this basic sense of fairness, whether it's for the individual or whether for it's the it's for the employer, and we have to make sure that those are being enforced. But we also have to move beyond rhetoric to reality. Senator Hurt has said that he supports the Arizona law, but he's had 10 years in Richmond to introduce something similar and hasn't done a thing. We went and fought to send 1,200 additional border agents down to our southern border, and it was a bill that Senator Hurt said that he would oppose. If we're serious about securing our southern border and securing our ports, that means adults stepping up to the plate and making the difficult decisions to make that happen. I do believe we gain a tremendous amount from being a diverse country, and that includes those coming through, uh, through the immigration process. But we can't have something that rewards those who break the law and punishes those uh, who do not. It's similar to the comment that he made about education. The education proposals he suggested would have a dramatic increase in property tax rates in the middle of a tough economy here. He was against the bill that made it more affordable to go to community college and voted to cut funding for UVA and Virginia Tech. Wait, this isn't just about the rhetoric that fits on a bumper sticker. This is a time where we have really tough challenges, and it's about who stepped up and actually put solutions on the table and fought for them. And that's what I've done, whether it comes to securing our southern border or making education affordable for every family in this country. All right. Thank you, Mr. Perriello. Our final question in this round, first for Mr. Perriello, it comes from my colleague at the Newsplex, anchor Tiffany Sargent. Tiffany. Good evening. Good evening. You've heard several of our questions, and now please take a moment and briefly ask each other a question. No long questions, please, but something you wanted to hear from your opponent, or rather 
wanted to them to answer. Um, is that first to me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Senator Hurt, I guess the question is whether you believe the things that are in your own ads and whether you have thought to just stop and, and ask your allies to prove to you that they're not taking money from these overseas corporations. I believe this will go down as an enormous scandal in American democracy. Um, but what we can start with is just asking the question of those folks and saying, prove to me that you're not doing this thing uh, that's illegal. Have you, have you stopped to consider doing that? Um, Congressman Periello, I, I guess that you were talking about the Chamber of Commerce and the, uh, and the dust up that's been uh, created, I think, by, by your campaign and others that would suggest that somehow the Chamber of Commerce has taken money uh, from overseas. I think that you will see, if you look uh, in, in all the coverage since that time, that that's been totally debunked. Uh, there's no evidence that, uh, that, that the Chamber of Commerce has done anything illegally. There's no evidence that they have taken any uh, significant foreign funds that would in any way affect the outcome of this election. If you want to talk about uh, uh, special interests and the special interests that are supporting uh, your campaign, I think that you should look at the 400000 plus dollars that are being dumped into your campaign by SEIU. I think you ought to look at the $100,000 that are being, being dumped into your campaign by MoveOn.org. You know, I am proud to have the support of the Chamber of Commerce. I am proud to have the, the support of the National Federation of Independent Business. You know, after it's all said and done, I can't think of many jobs that the SEIU or, or MoveOn.org have actually created. The Chamber of Commerce and NFIB know about job creation. And that's what this election is all about. All right, Mr. Hurt, ladies and gentlemen, please hold your applause. Mr. Hurt, now, if you would ask Mr. Periello a question. Uh, Congressman Periello, now that you have seen the effects, the, uh, the, the abominable effects of the health care bill, a bill uh, that has imposed $500 billion, $500 billion in new taxes, $500 billion in cuts to Medicaid, Medicare, uh, now that you've seen a cap and trade bill that would result uh, in 50,000 jobs lost in Virginia, now that you have seen a stimulus package that has completely failed to produce the uh, employment rates that you and, Cong and, and uh, the President and Nancy Pelosi promised, and has only led to 11,000 lost jobs. Now that you've seen all of those policies and their effects, will you now admit that they are a mistake? Well, first, Senator Hurd, I, I appreciate that you said the contributions from China have not made a significant impact. Is that the new standard for American democracy? China can spend money in our elections as long as it's not a substantial amount? Are you okay not asking those questions? This is a really big deal. The Chamber has admitted they've taken all this money from China. They've admitted it goes into a general account, and they've admitted that they're buying the ads out of the general account. I would think you would be eager to try to clear this up. And the gap has never been larger between the National Chamber, the president of whom supports outsourcing and was doing a training this week for American companies in China about how to take the jobs out of our district and send them to China. The gap between that and the businesses back home that are promoting innovation and creating jobs has never been bigger. You have to choose whether to stand with the outsourcers or whether to stand with Main Street that's creating the jobs that's hiring Americans. And to compare a wage earner in the United States to a Chinese corporation shows, I think, just an abominable uh, amount of being out of touch with what's going on in the district you and I share, which is much of Southern Virginia. In terms of the impact you're talking about, the $500 billion doesn't come out of Medicare. It goes from the people who've been cheating the system and puts it to the people who've been working hard and playing by the rules. What's more conservative than the idea of going after people who've been cheating the system, keeping it in the Medicare system, and making sure it's there for the people who worked hard and played by the rules? We made this promise to our seniors. We have to live up to this promise to our seniors. I got the endorsement this week for the Center to Protect Medicare and Social Security, a group that's a third Republicans, a third Democrats, a third Independents. They gave me a pair of boxing gloves because I've been fighting back to protect our seniors against these sorts of myths, to lie to seniors, to try to scare them with information that's not true. That doesn't have integrity to it. Leadership is about stepping up and making the tough decisions to go after the people cheating the system, to make that investment in Medicare, to make sure it's Ladies fair. and gentlemen, time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please hold your applause. That is the end of round one. I would remind you again. Please hold your applause until the debate is over. There'll be plenty of time for that in a moment. 
Now, as we get set for the next round, a quick note about the League of Women Voters who helped organize this debate. It is a trusted, nonpartisan political organization. It encourages informed and active participation in government. It works to increase understanding of major policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. While the League never endorses a candidate, League members do hands-on work to safeguard democracy and lead to civic improvement. If you're interested in learning about how you can have a similar impact, I encourage you to pick up some of the League's literature, which is available in the lobby tonight. And now it is time for round two. That is your turn to ask the questions. First, reading a question submitted by our audience for Mr. Hurt, here's my colleague, Newsplex reporter Jessica Jaglis. Jessica? Thank you, Dan. Well, our first question comes from the Newsplex audience, and we have received dozens of submissions, and we've reviewed every single one of them. And we just want to first thank you for all the thought and time you put in uh, for those questions. Unfortunately, we have time for only one. <laughs> So it better be good. <laughs> Cheryl Hines asks, in what way could you bring jobs in Virginia, to Virginia in all areas, not just city limits, but to rural areas as well? All right, and that is Mr. Hurt. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you to the audience for submitting all those questions. I, I would first say that I think a, a major difference between Congressman Perriello and myself is the fact that I believe that it is the private sector that creates jobs. It is not the government. And if you travel across the 5th District and you actually listen to the job creators, they make that loud and clear. If you listen to the people of the 5th District, they make that clear. Uh, that's not the philosophy that we have in Washington. In fact, we have a philosophy in Washington that does everything it can to suffocate job creation. Whether it is a massive takeover of our health care system that is going to kill jobs, whether it is a cap and trade bill that will kill more than 50,000 jobs in Virginia, whether it's a stimulus package, an out of control spending that will result in 11,000 fewer jobs uh, in, in, in the state of, in the, in the fifth district. Whether it's any of those policies, whether it's Congressman Periello's uh, position on cap and on uh, card check, all of those things together create a, an air of uncertainty. And if you talk to the people who are actually creating the jobs in the private sector, they'll tell you that that is, that, that, uh, that atmosphere is preventing them from hiring anyone. And you can only, you only have to look at the unemployment numbers to see just that. I believe and what I have heard across the 5th District is that if we are serious about creating jobs, then we need to allow those job creators to keep more of what they make, not less. That is, we need to reduce taxes. We need a congressman who will fight to reduce taxes on, on, on the small business and on the farm. Likewise, we need to reduce regulations. We need a congressman who's not going to fight for more government takeover of, of every aspect of our life, but for reduced regulations. If we do those two things and elect a new congress on November 2nd, I think that will go a long way to creating jobs in the 5th District. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Mr. Perriello, your response? Well, I thank Cheryl for the question, and I thank uh, Senator Hurt for the quasi-endorsement, since I have cut taxes 17 times on small business, including a uh, freeze on the capital gains tax for small business, quadrupling the startup deduction for a small business, reduce a 35 percent tax premium for those who are providing health insurance, a tax you want to increase, along with the 22 other taxes you've increased on Virginia families and businesses. So when it comes to cutting taxes on small business, I'm more than happy uh, to continue that debate as long as we want. Senator Hurt's right that the private sector creates debate, but he forgets the next sentence we hear from those business owners, which is, I need a highly trained and educated workforce. I need a 21st century infrastructure. I need a, a system that rewards innovation instead of rewarding outsourcing. Senator Hurt has supported the bill that rewards companies for sending American jobs overseas. I fought hard to close that loophole so that American businesses that create jobs for Americans get the rewards instead of those going overseas. There are those who think we have to outcompete China by becoming China. If we just pay people little enough, if we just wreck our environment enough, maybe we can eke out a few jobs in that race to the bottom. Well, even China's losing the race to the bottom. What makes America great is winning the race to the top. We out-innovate the world, out-compete the world. We have a better workforce in the world. We have these great universities and community colleges that put us ahead of the curve. And yes, we don't wait for India and China to crack energy independence. We do it first ourselves here in America. We beat everyone else. We didn't say, let the Russians get to the moon first 
or let the Soviets get to the moon first. We said, we're going to do it before anyone else. And we're going to do it on energy independence as well. And we are creating jobs with our farmers, our dairy and poultry farmers in the 5th District, our manufacturers, our investors, the advanced battery technology in the district we share, bringing those jobs of the future, bridging from the proud past in tobacco and furniture and textiles into this strong future and not waiting for any other country to beat us to the punch because we can beat the world. We can outcompete the world still. All right, Mr. Perriello, thank you. And Mr. Perriello will answer our next question first. Let's go back to Jessica Jaglis. All right, our next question was submitted by a News Talk 1260 listener. Clifford from Albemarle County asks, Putting aside your talking points and positions on highly publicized current and past issues, how do, you do, how do you decide a position on a new issue that might confront you during your term in office? For example, you poll your constituency and vo vote the majority view. Would you take a position depending on your ethics and moral views? Would you vote as directed by your party leaders? Or would you decide based on some other approach, and if some other approach, what approach? Right, Mr. Perriello, two minutes. I think it's a great question. I think you have to do what you think is right for your district. You need to meet with the people that know those issues best. You need to meet with all the people, uh, those who have been working on it for a long time, uh, on an education issue. It's important to talk to those in public education, those in private education, those in community colleges and technical trade schools, talking to parents about their needs and young people about their needs and expectations, and do what you think is right. Now, Senator Hurd is going to talk about the fact that he feels that I did things that were not in touch with the district. Well, he voted against unemployment benefits, breaking with the other Republicans in this area that knew it was an area with some of the highest unemployment in the state. He ignored factory owners who said they were going to have to close their factories if he voted for the bill that jacked up electric rates and hurt seniors and closed down jobs and sent them overseas. You have to do what's right. On the health care bill, uh, the largest employers in the part of the district we share, we talked to them and they said this was crucial. They might have to shut their doors as a hospital if we didn't move forward on health care reform. We talked to seniors who said under Senator Hurt's plan, Medicare starts to go bankrupt in seven years. So it's important to go out. But you have to understand that in politics, the real pressure is from the interest groups and the health insurance companies I knew and the oil companies I knew would spend millions against me. But my job is to stand up for the people and to stand up for what's right, not to kowtow to these interest groups based on what I know they can run against me in 30-second spots. Leadership is about looking beyond what fits in a 24-second commercial to what makes us move forward and gives everyone that opportunity uh, that, that Senator Hurt and I have had and been so blessed to have. That's, I think, what's important, to go out there, meet with the people that know the issues best, meet with as many people as you can, and and make the decision that you think is right. All right, thank you, Mr. Perriello. Mr. Hurt, your response. I certainly think that that question goes to the heart of our democratic republic, and I think that it goes to the heart of the question of, of, of any person who represents uh, his fellow citizens in the legislature. And I would submit to you that Congressman Perriello has not met that standard. If you stop and think about the fact that after 22 town halls, and he is so proud of the fact that he had 22 town halls in August a year ago to talk about the health care bill, stop and think about those, the, the, those town halls and what he heard. We all read the newspaper. Many of us were at those town hall meetings, and we know what the people of the 5th District told Congressman Perriello. They said, do not vote for that health care bill. We believe that it will cause uh, uh, health care premiums to skyrocket. It'll cost the, the, the cost of health care to skyrocket. Uh, the people of the 5th District knew the dire consequences of this bill. They did not want to have, they do not want to have the government between them and their doctor. They do not want a government takeover of the health care bill. And despite the fact that the people of the 5th District made that clear, abundantly clear, during those 22 town hall meetings, Congressman Perriello went to Washington, D.C., and who did he listen to? He didn't listen to the people that he represented. He didn't vote in their best interest. He voted with Nancy Pelosi. He voted, he voted as Nancy Pelosi told him to. And so what do we have in the aftermath? What do we have in the Ladies aftermath? What do we have in the aftermath? We have higher insurance premiums. Just look in your mailbox. You'll see higher insurance premiums. You're gonna, you see employers who are struggling now to keep a, an employer-based health care plan for their employees. You will see again and again examples that, that the people of the 5th District right, Congressman Perriello was wrong, and on November 2nd, we need to reward him for that. All right, thank you, Mr. Hurt. 
Our final question goes to Mr. Hurt. First, let's go back to Jessica Jaguars. Our final question in this round comes from a member of the audience here in Dickinson Theater. This question was selected by the League of Women Voters from all those submitted. And here's the question. I'm tired of people assuming the party of their choice has all the answers and solutions. What leader, thinker, or policy associated with your opponent's party do you most appreciate? Well, I think if you look back at my time in the General Assembly, you'll find somebody who's always stood up, as I just said, for the people that I represent. I've always put the people ahead of partisan interests, and I don't think that you can say that about Congressman Perriello. With respect to specific policies that I've parted ways with my, uh, with my leadership on, I, can think, I think, can think most prominently of the, uh, uh, of the free trade agreements, the NAFTA-style free trade agreements that a lot of Republicans uh, believe in and have stood up for. I have made it clear in this campaign, I am against those agreements. I think that uh, having watched over the last 10, 15 years, having personally watched the devastation of those agreements and what they caused to, 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 to the hardworking people of the 5th District, I can tell you that they are wrong. And I can tell you that I will stand up against them if given the privilege of representing the people of the 5th District. Thank you. Mr. Hurt, thank you. Mr. Perriello, your response? Two minutes. Well, Senator Hurt hasn't disagreed with his party on free trade as much as he's disagreed with himself. Uh, he was for it, and then he said he wasn't sure how he felt about it, and then yesterday, for the first time, he said he was actually against these trade agreements. He hasn't taken positions on many issues this year, uh, but he has flip-flopped so far on the trade issue, on earmark reform, and on tax increases. So it's hard to really figure out where to pin that down. But what we have seen, and I just want to point out very quickly before I talk about where I've broken with the party. Last week, Senator Hurd admitted that he had not read the health care bill that he was so against. This, year, this week, he's talking about town hall meetings that he didn't even attend and claiming to know what people said at those meetings. I didn't see you at the town halls, and I haven't seen you do any others. Nor did I see you at the meetings where we gathered doctors in your own district nurses in your own district, hospital administrators in your district who did support the health care bill, employers who did that. So this is something where I think you, need, you have to go out and listen to all the people and not just be stuck in a cocoon. And this issue of higher premiums may be new to you, but it's not new to everyone else. This is actually a lower increase this year than we've seen in the last five years. Middle class families and small businesses have been kicked in the stomach. I have to ask you, which policy of your <laughs> opponents would you support? Uh, I have uh, opposed the bailouts. I opposed the president's budget. I've stood up for Second Amendment rights, including uh, getting the endorsement of the NRA. Uh, I've challenged both parties on trade deals and going after China for manipulating its currency. I think when it comes to Washington too often, the two parties are together in protecting the powerful the interest groups instead of standing up for everyday folks. I've been willing to vote to investigate powerful chairmen in my own party. So over and over again, voting with Republicans over 60 percent of the time. But to me, both parties are broken, and what we really need is independence. All right, Mr. Perriello, thank you very much. And now we return to our panel. It's time for our final round of questions. Again, if the candidates keep your responses brief, we'll have time for more questions and we'll have complete closing statements. First, let's go back to Lauren. She has a question for Mr. Perriello. Mr. Perriello, what is your view of green jobs and when can we realistically expect to see new green jobs in the 5th District for low-income, rural, and unemployed citizens in particular? Uh, I am a big believer in green jobs in the new energy economy, and we don't have to look into the future anymore. They're already happening. We see it in construction crews that have switched from housing starts over to renovating existing building stock. And we have manufacturing right in southern Virginia to build the window film and other things that are part of that new energy economy. We've seen with LifeBat, we just cut the ribbon on, that's moved its U.S. headquarters to southern Virginia. We see with the investments in broadband increasingly the ability to telecommute and have virtual jobs in insourcing into some of our lower income parts of central and southern Virginia. We have dairy farmers turning cow manure into power, poultry farmers turning chicken waste into power. These aren't in a science fiction novel. They're happening. This is the excitement that I think Senator Hurt's missing when we talk about energy independence, which people in our district do overwhelmingly support. 
because we know that we have to beat China and India and Europe to these ideas, and our farmers can do it, our manufacturers can do it. I talked to an investor just today, and he said the only thing keeping him from investing here is the fact that the Senate didn't pass an energy job, so he's looking at China and other places who are the winners of this obstruction from the Republicans, instead of having the courage to go out and say America can do this better, America can do this first. We see it in an area like Charlottesville that's doing relatively well, but still has 25% of residents living below the poverty line. When we think about what we could do, if we take things like Homestar and Rural Star to scale, to scale, where you help to forward fund the renovations in a home using American construction crews, using American manufactured products to reduce the electric bills that Senator Hurt helped jack up. This is a place where we make our country safer, we make ourselves stronger, and we're putting people to work building and making and growing things right here in America. The jobs of tomorrow are already happening today. The question is whether they're going to happen here or overseas, and I have fought my tail off to make sure that they happen in Central and Southern Virginia. Mr. Perriello, thank you. Mr. Hurt, your response. Well, you know, I'd, I, I have traveled a whole lot over the last year and talked to a lot of different folks uh, who are actually the job creators. Uh, not the government, but the people who are the small businesses and are the small farmers. And I think that, that, that uh, jobs that focus on renewable energy are important. And I think that there are, are, are certainly some instances where we need to, to, uh, to use the, 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 the power of the government to, 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 uh, to encourage that. But by the same token, you know, the idea that we need to again make it and grow it in the 5th District uh, suggests the Congressman Perriello has forgotten that there are a lot of people who still make things and a lot of people who still grow things in the 5th District. And he's forgotten those people. He's forgotten the folks at Lawrenceville Brick who make good bricks that are a, a major part of that economy. He's forgotten the folks at Bedford, Bedford Weaving. He's forgotten the folks uh, at uh, Sam Moore Furniture Company. He's forgotten the small businesses and the big businesses all across the 5th District who depend who depend on low taxes and reduced regulations to succeed. And what has Congressman Perriello given those folks for the last 18 months? He hadn't given them reduced taxes. I mean, this is a guy that's voted for a trillion dollars in new taxes in just 18 months. He hadn't given them reduced taxes. He hasn't given them reduced regulations. He's given them increased taxes and increased regulations, I think. And from what I, and, and what I have heard as I've traveled across the 5th District from those small business owners, those who are mom and pop stores to 500 employees to 1,500 employees, what they will tell you is that the last 18 months in Washington, D.C. with Congressman Perriello has been an assault on the free enterprise system. When you look at a health care bill that will kill jobs, you look at a cap and trade bill that will kill jobs, and you look at a stimulus package that has left us with 11,000 jobs fewer than when we first started. You look at Congressman Perriello's position on, uh, on card check, and you look at this financial right. regulation bill. He's Mr. not Hurt. giving us jobs. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Friedman, your question first for Mr. Hurt. Another question on education. President Obama and Governor McDonnell, a Democrat and a Republican who often disagree, agree that the Commonwealth and our nation needs to increase the number of college graduates dramatically over the next decade. What will you do? What policies do you support to help achieve that goal? Well, again, let's look at it through the lens of the question, your good first question, which is what is the role of the federal government? And I think that we have to keep in mind that I believe that the federal government's role in education should be limited as opposed uh, to, 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 to the role of the state government and to the, uh, and to the local governments and to, the, and to the role of the parents, most important. But what I, I do believe is that we as a country should have as a goal, and I think that, that, that it needs to start in the states, uh, but we need to have a goal to graduate more college students. We, when you look at China and you look at India and you look at the number of in engineers, I think 600,000 uh, engineers uh, are going to be, be produced in China, 400,000 in India, 40,000 in the United States. If we're serious about technical and engin engineering, if we're serious about uh, winning uh, global competition in terms in the marketplace, then we've got to step up to the plate and we've got to be serious about our education system. So I think that if you look at my time in the General Assembly, you'll see somebody who has always stood up uh, for higher education and always stood up 
uh, to, to promote those, uh, those goals that we're talking about, I think it's critical. And I look forward to continuing that in the federal, in the federal government. Mr. Hurt, thank you. Mr. Perriell, two minutes. Well, if you cut at the federal level, which Senator Hurt suggests, and you cut at the state level, which is his track record of voting, what is the education that's left? Virginia had been the best state in the country to do business until last year. The reason we moved out of the number one spot was because of cuts in education. We have to send a signal to business, and I hear this from business leaders every day, that we are serious about education, we are serious about jobs and skill training. It has to actually begin, I believe, with early childhood development. I've talked to a number of business leaders in our most economically depressed areas who say if we aren't starting that early, we're already getting people tracked off. We have to innovate in our schools, and I do believe that that means charter schools and competition within our public school system and other things that can help reward excellence uh, in public education. I had 10 great years in the public schools in Albemarle County, an opportunity many don't have because of school systems that aren't quite up to that amazing level. We need to make sure that every kid has that and that college is a, real, is a reality and not just a dream. That it's not something that's going to be forty or fifty thousand dollars of debt. But if you work hard and play by the rules and you do those work study programs in college, you're going to be able to come out and not be saddled with that. And we have to start career and technical training earlier in the process. So someone who may not be headed to four-year college, it's still we bring out the wisdom and the genius of that skills that they do have to offer. One of the things that I fought for on the Veterans Affairs Committee is to make sure that the new GI Bill applies to technical and skills training for our returning veterans. We have over 300,000 new veterans enrolled in four-year college and community college today under the new GI Bill. We want to make sure that those who want to engage in career and technical training have that same opportunity. I think this is a great moment where we do need to reinforce our commitment to education and skills training, and that's a great signal to send uh, to our employers as well. Mr. Perriello, thank you. Let's go back to Melissa from WCHV Radio. Your question, starting first with Mr. Perriello. An overwhelming amount of WCHV listeners sent and submitted questions about the recently passed health care law. President Obama promised the new health care law would lower premiums and Americans could keep their private insurance and current policy. However, right now premiums are going up substantially, making it difficult for Virginians to keep their current plan, and over 30 companies have had to receive waivers from mandates to continue providing health insurance to their employees. Can you comment on this? And if elected or re-elected, would you choose to vote for changes to the law or to get rid of it altogether and start over? And what policies are you for? Uh, thank you. I certainly think that there's much more that we can do to improve the situation with health care reform. I happen to support tort reform and other measures that can come in. But I think what we see here is also a situation where people seem to, again, be waking up to the premium increases that have been getting stuck to people for a while. That was the problem. We were, they were bankrupting the small business owner in the middle class. I've talked to so many small business owners who are paying no federal income tax this year because of the tax cut we brought in with the health care bill, a tax cut that Senator Hurt wants to remove to cover 35 percent of the premiums that they're already paying. That's a huge tax relief that so many small business owners have been thankful for. I got a call on, the, on a radio show the other day from someone who said, I'm glad you listened to me. I have a six-year-old son who has a very expensive disease, and for the first time in my life I go to bed at night not having to worry about whether my child is going to have health insurance for the rest of his life. There were so many stories like that throughout this time that did come up at town halls and other places. The experiences of people who are able to stay on their parents' insurance now until their 26th birthday so they might go and get that community college degree or that technical training program. We're letting in every one individual small business buy the same health insurance that members of Congress get. Senator Hurt wants, them, wants members of Congress to get a different plan than everyone else. It goes back to the same fairness debate we had before. I think it's fair that a small business owner or an individual should have access to that same competitive plan. And it's worth noting that it is not a government plan, and it's not a government-run plan. It's a competition between private plans. When I got there a year and a half ago, I thought there was a congressional plan. I opened up the book, and it's just a hundred private companies competing with each other for the business of me and other federal employees. I don't see why others shouldn't have that same competitive market that brings down costs and increased quality, and that's the truth of what's in the bill. So this doesn't change overnight, but we are moving in the right direction of more accountability for those who have been jacking up rates for the middle class and small business. Mr. Perriello, thank you. Mr. Hurt, your answer. 
Well, I would vote to repeal the bill. Uh, if we cannot repeal it, I would vote to, uh, to, to defund it. I think that if we can't uh, def defund it completely, I think we'll have to wait until, for two years until we have a new president and we can fully repeal the bill. I think that it's a bad bill. I think that we need to start over. The president promised, Congressman Periello promised when this first debate began, that, they were, that, that, that we would ensure 40 million new people that the government would run it and that we would reduce the cost of health care. And what you've seen has not, has not matched that at all. What we have seen instead has been the fact that people who have good insurance are losing it. People who, who are provided insurance by employers can't have it. They can't have the policies that they were promised by Congressman Periello and promised by this president that they would be able to keep if they enacted this law. The idea that this bill will reduce costs is, 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 has not been borne out either. I think that anybody, anybody who has any background in economics, anybody who has any idea about the laws of supply and demand would, could tell you that, by, that, that the only health care costs would only increase by reducing the competition. That is the only way that we are going to um, decrease the cost of health care in this country. We have got to do a couple of things. We need to allow insurance companies to sell policies across state lines. That would create competition and that would reduce costs. We need to take real steps at tort reform. If we're serious about tort reform uh, and we are serious about lowering health care costs, we need to reduce the cost of frivolous lawsuits and we need to reduce medical malpractice premiums. And I think finally, if we're serious about uh, hooking up patient accountability to the decisions that are financial decisions that are made for health care and we're serious about reducing health care costs, I think things like health savings accounts are the way to go. All right, Mr. Hurt, thank you very much. And we're doing so well on the answers. Lauren, we may have one more question for you. But first, let's go to my colleague, Tiffany Sargent. As you may know, Charlottesville is always voted as one of the best retirement cities in the country. What's your message to people considering retiring here about what should be the Social Security retirement age? Should it be moved back to 70? If you don't support that, what specific cuts in Social Security benefits would you support to equal that savings? Well. I have said from the beginning of this campaign that I don't support any changes to the Social Security uh, program that is currently in place. And I believe that that's a promise that's been made uh, to those who have paid into the system over the years, and I believe that it's a promise that's got to be kept. There's no question that we will have great challenges in balancing our budget with a new Congress, but we've got to remain committed to that. I believe that we can do that without affecting Social Security benefits, but I think that there are a couple of things that have to happen. First, we have got to get spending under control in Washington, and that means cutting programs, cutting uh, bureaucracy, doing those things that create a culture of less spending in Washington, not more. Right now, the answer to every problem is increased spending in Washington. There's never a discussion about what the priorities of government should be or are. And as a consequence, we've got a $1.3 trillion deficit and $13 trillion in debt that our children and our grandchildren have to pay. I think that this question also points up the importance of the health care debate. I think it's important that we reform health care if we're serious about reducing the bottom line costs of our government to pay for Medicare and Medicaid. And we can only do that if we adopt policies that reduce the cost of health care, not increase them. And that's the opposite of what Congressman Periello has supported. He has left us with a health care bill that's going to have health care costs skyrocketing. And then finally, as important as anything, as we attempt to balance our budget, and I hope with a balanced budget amendment, what we need to do is we need to encourage policies that encourage job growth. If we don't see job growth, we're not going to be able to balance the budget like I think that we should be able to. The only way that we're going to increase job growth is by adopting policies that reduce taxes, allow those who create jobs to keep more of what they make, reduce regulations, and allow those small businesses and farms to succeed, the true job creators in the 5th District. All right, Mr. Hurt, thank you. Mr. Periello, your answer. I still think this is a wonderful place to retire and would certainly encourage anyone to do so. Uh, and here is an area where I think we have fought hard to make sure that we have the great hospitals that we have are going to remain stable going forward because of the reforms we made. And I encourage Senator Hurt to read about those hospitals and the health care here in this area. If you look at what we've done, we have two choices here for seniors. Under Senator Hurt's plan, Medicare starts to go bankrupt in seven years. We've ensured that solvency for a generation. Under Senator Hurt's plan, payments to doctors are cut 21 percent. 
to try to choke doctors out of the system. We shored up that reimbursement and actually increased it in rural areas. Under Senator Hurt's plan, there are cuts in benefits. You have to have increased co-pays for wellness and prevention visits, which we should be encouraging seniors to do, not punishing them for. And his raises the cost of prescription drugs that we fought hard against the special interest groups to reduce for our seniors. And last week, Senator Hurt came out against the cost of living adjustment for our seniors, even after raising the electric rates for those who are on a fixed income. He supported a $700 billion unpaid for tax break for millionaires, but couldn't do $17 billion to help seniors get through a tough year, something that I fought for. That's why I've gotten the endorsement of the Center for Protecting Medicare and Social Security. I got those boxing gloves for fighting back for seniors. It is important. It's a statement about the promise we've made to our seniors. It's a statement about everyone that there's going to be a secure uh, and dignified retirement uh, for, for us or for our parents who are aging. And I think it's a very, very important thing that we continue to do. And I think the track record of who stood up for seniors is very clear. All right, Mr. Perriello, thank you very much. And it looks like we won't have time for that extra question. So now we'll move on to our closing statements. Each candidate gets three minutes. This was determined by a coin flip. Mr. Hurt, you will go first. Thank you. Th once again, thanks to the League of Women Voters and PVCC and all of you who are here tonight. You know, I hope that I've made it clear in the course of this debate that I believe that this election is an important election and it's about returning the American dream to what it once was. You know, I, like many families across the 5th District, Kathy and I, my wife and I, uh, have been blessed to be able to come back to rural Main Street, Virginia, and live the American dream. We've been able to do that because our parents and the generations that went before us were willing to make the sacrifices possible for that. But I believe that the American dream is now under assault. Two years ago, Congressman Perriello ran for office and he promised, he promised that he'd be an independent voice for the people of the 5th District. He hasn't been an independent voice. He has voted with Nancy Pelosi 90% of the time. On all of, his, all of her signature issues, she, he has voted with Nancy Pelosi on all of them. Whether it's a health care bill that gives us $500 billion in new taxes and cuts Medicare by $500 billion. Whether it's a cap and trade tax that would uh, it lose 50,000 jobs uh, in Virginia alone, or whether it is uh, uh, a failed stimulus package that would result in 11,000 lost jobs, create $1.3 trillion uh, in deficit spending and $13 trillion in debt, all money that our children and grandchildren have to pay. You know, if you look at his record, you'll find somebody who hasn't stood with the people of the 5th District. He stood with Nancy Pelosi again and again. As I have traveled across the 5th District for the last year, I have heard from the people. I've heard from the job creators who, who understand that it's the private sector that creates jobs and not the government. They have told us again and again, please reduce our taxes. Allow us to keep more of what we make so that we can in turn create jobs. Please reduce the regulatory burden that is killing us so that we can in turn be more successful. And they said, above all, please, Mr. Hurt, be somebody that will listen to us and stand up for us in Washington, D.C. You know, if you like government-run health care, if you like a cap-and-trade tax scheme, if you like a failed stimulus package, then you should vote for Tom Perriello. But if you believe like I do that we need to have policies that reduce the size and scope of government and that will lead to opportunity and prosperity. If you believe, like I do, that we need to fight for a renewed American dream, vote for Robert Hurt on November 2nd. Thank you. No, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. There'll be plenty of time for applause when we're done. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Perriello, your closing remarks. Well, thanks, everyone, for being here. And thank you again to PVCC and, and uh, to the League of Women Voters for being involved. This is indeed a crucial election. And I think it's about who's a fighter. If you like to pick up Senator Hurt's cadence, if you want the sort of talking points approach, if you want to hide from the tough issues, if you want someone who's not going to step up and do the things necessary to make America and Virginia strong again, then I suppose you can vote for Senator Hurt. He didn't step up with Governor McDonnell on a tough budget this year or with Governor Kane on a tough budget last year. He hasn't been willing to take a position on how to create jobs beyond things that are two or three words long. This has got to be our time in America. This has got to be our time to believe that we can still outcompete the world. This is not our time to put our head in the sand. 
The American dream is crucial here, but how does that American dream look if you're cutting funding to education and not supporting early childhood development or not making college more affordable? If you're not standing up and supporting the small business lending fund and the 17 tax cuts for small business? I believe we've taken great steps to try to rebuild America's competitiveness. And we've got to get out of the mentality that says the right solutions are the ones that turn things around overnight. Instant gratification is part of what got us into this place. A greed and instant gratification culture in Washington among politics, politicians looking for symbolism instead of solutions. On Wall Street, people who are building an economy around speculation instead of building, making, and growing things. And even among homeowners and consumers. We have to start looking at the next great American decade and the next great American century because we can still out-invent the world and out-compete the world. But we can't do it with this approach of acting like we don't have problems, or this approach that says, let's look more like China. If we just stick it to workers more, if we just stick it to the environment more, if we just act like these problems aren't there. But that's not what makes us great. We don't back down from a fight. And Senator Hurt, you can disagree with me, but don't disrespect me and suggest I'm getting pushed around by anyone, because I stand back and fight in Washington. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen please, please hold your applause. You and I know that the real power in Washington and Richmond is not the leaders of the two parties. It's the people that write the big checks. We've seen the over $400,000 coming into your campaign, possibly from overseas, and you're not even pushing back on that. This Ladies is a time. Gentlemen. This is a deadly serious time to put America first, put Amer give that level playing field to American workers and American businesses, and I still know that we can now compete the world in energy, in technology, in automotive. We are going to do that with the two out of every three new jobs coming from the small businesses. And we've cut their taxes, we've gotten a small business lending fund out, we've helped give them some of the advantages, and the facts just do come down that way. It's not okay to just deny the facts we need in the next two weeks. Voters to take this seriously. Look beyond whatever sources you have and look and test the facts and look at who's gone out to try to okay. fight for American jobs and Mr. competitiveness. Mr. Perriello, your time is up. All right, thank you very much for both of our candidates. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And our thanks as well goes out to our candidates, to our panelists, and Piedmont Virginia Community College for making this facility available to us. Also, we'd like to thank our audience joining us across Central Virginia on CBS 19, ABC 16, Newsplex.com, and the Monticello Media Stations. We'll be posting this full hour debate on our website, Newsplex.com, as soon as possible. Please join Tiffany and myself tonight on 19 News Nightcast at 11 o'clock. Finally, to our audience here in the Dickinson Auditorium, thank you for your attendance and your enthusiasm.